Well, good morning. Guys, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up with me to the book of John chapter 8. John 8. I'm real excited about uh, today. We have something very special planned for you. At the end of this service, just like we did in the first service this morning, we are bringing our children's ministry in, and our second through fifth graders are going to come in and share with you some of the stuff that, that they are learning back in children's ministry on a, a week-to-week basis. It, it was adorable. I tell you what, I, I had the opportunity to uh, move them and have them do it earlier in the services, and I decided not to because I didn't want to follow their cuteness. So, um, uh, <laughs> amen. <laughs> so, uh, so we're going to have them coming up at the end of the service. It's going to be very special. Uh, I know many of you received an email from Pastor Hooper this last week talking about uh, the message he was excited to share with you this week. However, unfortunately, uh, I received a phone call yesterday afternoon and because uh, of a head cold and sickness that is getting um, uh, to where he can hardly talk over the phone, uh, he called me and had me come in today. Uh, so unfortunately, he's not here uh, with us today. So please be praying for him and for his health. And today, you're stuck with me. So uh, uh, let's do this. So, <laughs> so if you got your Bibles, we're going to look in John chapter 8. Today we're talking about being faithful to the truth. Jesus is talking uh, to a group of people and telling them what it looks like for us to be his disciples. If we're truly going to be his followers, this is what he expects of us. So um, we're going to look here at John chapter 8 verse 31. It says, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you've been in church for any period of time, you've probably heard this verse before. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I grew up in a Christian home, and this was one of those verses that I would hear all the time. People get excited about this verse because they think, you know, we all need freedom, and this is telling you how you can have freedom. If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. So people quote this verse all the time. And I think it's a, a verse that we're attracted to because if we're to be honest in this room, every one of us in this room has some area of our life that we wish we had more freedom in. If we're to be honest, I think there are people in this room that would say, you know, there is an area of my life that I keep secret, I keep hidden, nobody else knows about it, and, and it's been an area of a, of a battle, it's been a battleground for years where I've tried to gain freedom over something, and yet I, I tend to fail over and over and over again, and for people in here it might be a, an addiction, it might be a, a sin, a bad habit of some sort that that we think, you know, someday I hope to gain freedom over this area, but right now I just feel completely trapped. Maybe it's not a sin or something like that, but maybe it's a relationship that you're in, that you feel like the relationship is just stuck. It's like, no matter how much time and energy and effort you put in the relationship to get it to move forward, it feels like you're just trapped in that same place, stuck in that same place. So we hear verses like this, this verse that, to... To know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And we think, well, that's it. If I could just know the truth, if I know more, if I can understand more, then then that's going to be what frees me from this situation. And see, what we're doing there is we're taking one of the things that God says out of context. Because God says a whole statement, and then he ends the statement, is, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The, the, The statement is not... To us, that if you want freedom, you have to know the truth. That's not what Jesus is saying. In fact, he's saying that's kind of an end result of the first part of this statement. Because, in fact, if we were to look at it, the truth doesn't set anyone free. Just knowing more doesn't set anyone free. In fact, you can be in the same situation, in the same circumstances you are now, knowing more than you did in the past, being in the same circumstances and situation. The, the overweight person is still in the same situation even though they know how to lose weight. They know more information about dieting and exercise and yet they find themselves in the same situation on the couch eating a tub of ice cream while watching Biggest Loser, you know? I, I don't know, what is it about that? Like every time, well, I, I, every time I watch someone sweat on Biggest Loser, it's like I get hot, I have to go eat ice cream. I don't know. But you might know more about diet and exercise, but just knowing that truth 
didn't do anything to your physical circumstances. It, it didn't change it. You're not set free. You're still in the same place. Um, you could be in an addiction, and you could learn more about that addiction. You could learn that there are different step programs that you can get involved in, different recovery groups you can get involved in that would help you overcome the addiction. You could learn more about what the addiction is actually doing to you physically, how it's hurting you and your relationships and your emotions. You could learn so much more and know so much more truth and yet still be in the exact same place that you're in right now. So it becomes discouraging to us where we as Christians hear verses like this. And since we don't take the whole verse, we don't take the whole thing that Jesus says, we just take a little part of it, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Think, well, I'm trying, I'm learning, I'm going to church, I'm hearing more, and yet I'm still stuck. What's up with that? Uh, I, I, they told me to read this book, I read the book, I'm still stuck. I, I went to Pastor Super sermon last week, it was an incredible sermon, I'm stuck still stuck. What I think we need to do is we need to look back at the entire statement that Jesus says because what he says is a very powerful truth that I hope we can all hold on to uh, before we leave today. And I want to look at this verse again in John 8, 31. And Jesus says this, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teaching." That might be something that you want to underline in your Bible. Maybe write this down, but you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teaching. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. See, the way that you gain freedom is to remain faithful to the truth that you know. To do the things that you've learned. To, it's not good enough to just know something. You actually have to do them. And, and remaining faithful to that truth, no matter how small it might be, is going to be what helps you get your breakthrough. It's not that you know more, because knowing more without action doesn't help you at all. It's that you do what you know, that you remain faithful to Jesus' teaching. Jesus teaches us so many different things about different areas of our lives. And he tells us, it, relationally, if you want to get better, you do these things. Financially, if you want to get better, you do these things. Spiritually, if you want to get better, you do these things. And he, he tells us, he gives us the truth. And it's not good enough to just have the truth. He's telling us, you have to be faithful to that. You have to do it. It's not good enough to just go to church and say, yeah, I did church this week. You got What did you learn, and are you implementing that into your life? Are you allowing God to change you by doing the things that he's telling you to do? See, for many of us, too, in this room, we'd say that maybe you have done the right things, but you just haven't done them wrong enough, long enough. You, you're doing right. You're doing the truth. You're, the things Jesus has told you to do, you're doing them, but you just haven't done them long enough. I went to the doctor last year with a, a, a cold, and I, he gave me antibiotics. And about three days into taking the antibiotics, I felt great, so I stopped taking the antibiotics. You know what happened. Not only did I get sick, I was sicker then than I was in the first place. Because I was doing the right thing, taking the antibiotics, but I didn't do it long enough. And for many of us, we have to recognize that, that God is giving us truth, and he's, he's trying to teach you how to live your life and change your life in a way that's pleasing to him so that he can bless you. And, and we get that truth, but we have to remain faithful to it if we want to see the blessings come. I can tell you that the enemy sits back confidently and is not worried when you and I come to church and hear great messages. He's not worried when you read a good book because he expects, he fully expects in our human nature that we are going to hear something great. We're going to learn some truth, but then after we try it a little bit and realize it's a little bit uncomfortable doing something God's way, now we're going to get frustrated and say, you know what, I guess that's just not for me. And we're going to go back to our same old lifestyle, the way we used to do things. I mean, after all, it was comfortable doing it that way. This way is just a little bit different. So we're going to go back to our old way of thinking and not end up changing at all. So when you go and you hear great messages, you read books, the enemy's like, oh no, I'm scared. When the enemy gets scared is when you actually start doing the things that God is telling you to do. If you were to go down into my basement, you would see that uh, I have uh, I've taken some of my resources to um, 
uh, buy some equipment down in my basement. I've got a treadmill. I've got uh, some free weight equipment, all this exercise equipment. I've got a TV set up with a DVD player down there. And on a shelf next to it, you would notice that there is a DVD case. And if you were to wipe the dust off of that DVD case, you would read that it says P90X on it. And I'm telling you, I, I, I did the investment. I mean, I, I went to the store. I paid the money for the, the weightlifting equipment, for the treadmill. I got the TV and the DVD player. I bought the P90X DVD kit. In fact, I actually opened it up and watched one of those one time. It was crazy. <laughs> These guys do crazy stuff on that. And it, but what happened is, I, I, as soon as I was done with that, I mean, I, I put it right back in the case, and I went and got on the, the scale and saw that I hadn't lost any weight while I was eating the ice cream watching my show, you know? I thought, well, this doesn't work. See, I mean, I, I think if I tell you a story like that, you think, that is absolutely ridiculous, Dan. I mean, you, you're not eating ice cream watching workout videos because you know that that doesn't work. Well, I think we can all understand it very simply when it comes to the physical realm. We see when it comes to weight loss, and I'm not picking on the weight loss topic. I'm just picking on myself here when it comes to this. But I think it's something we can understand very simply, naturally, is that if you do the right things physically, if you diet and exercise, over time you will see results. And we expect to see that. In fact, uh, if, if you are doing the right things and you don't see results, there's something wrong. So you expect that there will be changes in your life. There will be good as a result of you dieting and exercising. You will see a physical change because of that. So to just have the information, like to have a, a DVD kit that tells you how to do P90X exercises, to have a book that tells you how to diet is not good enough, to know that you need to, uh, to burn calories and to know that you need to have your heart rate at whatever level, to know those different things is not good enough unless you actually put them to practice. And it takes deciding that every day I am going to put to practice what God wants me to do. See, the breakthrough comes in life when you're faithful to the truth. When you say, I, I, I know what God wants me to do, and I'm going to do it today, but I'm also going to do it tomorrow, and I'm going to get up the next day and do it that day too, and the next day I'm going to get up and do it again. And when you're consistent, when you're faithful to the truth, that is when you begin to see breakthrough. If you were to go to the gym and work out one time, and then, and then come home, and, and the next day you didn't see breakthrough, so you quit, you go, well, that's not how it works. You have to... Stay faithful to that which you know will work. And that's why God tells us that he's given us his word. He, he's given us a word that will speak to us every day of our life. will make it so clear to us, what am I supposed to do today? God, God wants to tell you what he wants you to do today. In fact, I, I know many great men and women in our church who are business owners who start their day every day reading out of Proverbs or Ecclesiastes to to gain wisdom when it comes to their, their businesses, uh, how they work with their employees and how they do business in our culture in this day and age. And they'll get up one morning and they'll read in Proverbs that you should handle this type of a business situation this way, that it would be wise to make this sort of a decision. So that way when they go into their day and they're faced with a business decision, they're going, well, wow, that was so simple. I, I I know exactly what God wants me to do, and then they can be faithful to what God wants them to do. See, God has given you this gift of his word to speak to you every day. And, and, and we, we talk about this all the time because it's something that, that it takes initiative. It takes deciding, I am going to be faithful to this so that you can build the habit of putting God first. It takes faithfulness to put... His word in your life every day. In Joyce Meyer's book, Power Thought, she says it takes at least 30 days of consistency to even begin to create a habit. That at day 31 is when you're actually beginning a habit. So if you're going to do anything good, you do it for 30 days and you just did good stuff for 30 days, but at day 31 you're starting the habits. 
day 32, day 33. And as you stay consistent and faithful to that, you begin, what used to be awkward and strange now becomes very natural. Last week I talked to you about one of my passions, and that's bow hunting, and, um, and talked about uh, uh, my love for, for archery, the sport of archery. When it comes to archery, one of the things you'll learn is that you have to have what athletes call as muscle memory. That you don't want to go into the woods and, and not be comfortable with your equipment, so you're pulling back on the string and trying to get it all stretched out and, and don't really know how to hold the bow right. It, the books will tell you and the instructors will tell you, you need to shoot your bow so often that your muscles just remember exactly where to go, and you've created a muscle memory, so what used to be awkward and feel uncomfortable is now natural to you. So now when I'm hunting, whenever I have to draw my bow, I don't even think about it. It just happens. I'm just drawn and I'm ready to shoot because my muscles know what's expected of them because I've taken something that was awkward and did it constantly enough to where it then became very natural. You see, in, in all sorts of sports, my wife and I love watching the Olympics. We watch gym, uh, gymnastics in the Olympics this year, and to see those little women jump and do flips on the, the balance beam to me is like the craziest thing in the world. And you'll learn that what they did is that nobody gets up on a balance beam and tries to do a flip. That's not how it happens. I mean, if I were to pay you money right now to jump up on the balance beam and do a flip, there wouldn't be any, maybe one crazy person in this room. I don't know. It depends on how much money. We'd say, yeah, I'll try to do a flip on the balance beam. But what will happen is a gymnast will go to the floor, to a mat somewhere, and will do a flip over and over and over and over and over and over again and over again until it becomes so natural to her that she knows exactly where her feet are going to land. And it becomes so natural that it doesn't matter if she's on the floor. It doesn't matter if she's on the balance beam. It doesn't matter if she's on top of a table. It doesn't matter where she's at. She can do the exact same thing over again because it's natural to her because she stayed faithful to something that she knew. And see, this is the principle that we've got to understand what God is trying to tell us when it comes to breakthrough in every area of your life. He says, you'll know you're my disciples by, by the fact that you're faithful to the things that I tell you. That I'm going to tell you to do things and they're going to feel weird. They're going to be really awkward. I'm going to tell you to forgive people. And forgiving people, not only is it weird and awkward, it's something you just flat out don't want to do. Uh, th there are people who have frustrated me to the point where I, it hurts me to go to them and to forgive them. I, I don't want to do that. But Jesus is saying, I want you to do that. And I want you to stay faithful in that. Continue to forgive them. Forgive them again. And forgive them again. And forgive them again. And as you do that, it will become more and more natural. And you will become a forgiving person. And breakthrough will begin to happen in your life. And he shows us this in every different area of your life, when it comes to relationships, when it comes to finances. I mean, he just writes it out there so simple for us in finances, what he expects us to do so that he can bless us financially. He tells us to bring the 10% uh, to the house of God, 10% of our income. And, and so many of us go, well, that's weird, that's awkward, that's strange. My friends think I'm crazy. What are you talking about? And he's saying, just do it. And if you talk to someone who has been tithing for years and who's been blessed by God by their faithfulness to him, they'll say, I don't even think about that anymore. That's just a natural thing that, of course, I put God first. And as a result of that, he blesses me in such a powerful way. See, God is looking to bless us. See, we don't talk about this today just to discourage you because maybe you've been struggling and saying, yeah, I know there's things I should be doing and I'm just not doing them. But in fact, instead, we're, we're talking about this today because your struggle has an expiration date on it. That, that this, this battle of going, well, I, I want to get better, I want to do things his way, but I keep feeling, that has an expiration date on it. The Bible tells us in James 4, 7, it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. That if you resist the enemy's temptations to walk away from what God wants for you, and you begin doing what God wants for you every day of your life, and the enemy is going to flee from you, and you're going to have more and more freedom in that area. But part of the problem is we don't, um, we don't move forward in the truth because we don't know the truth. The Bible tells us in Hosea 4, 6, 
My people are destroyed because of their lack of knowledge, because they have rejected knowledge. Guys, we talk about this all the time. We talk about the fact that that you need to read your Bible. If you are a follower of Christ, you need to read your Bible. And, And I know it annoys some people that it's a topic we hit on so much, but guys, it comes up so often. God gives you such a clear plan of what he wants for you in life, and so many of us miss out on it. And like Hosea says, that we are destroyed because we don't even know what God wants for us. We don't know his plan for us. In the last 12 years I've been doing ministry here at Fellowship Church, time and time and time and time and time again, people will come to me and ask questions of me and ask counsel of me because of different difficulties they're going through. And I always ask the same question back to them first. Are you reading your Bible? And guys, I'm telling you, 98% of the time, the answer is no, I'm not reading my Bible. Now, am I saying that I believe that 98% of our church is not reading their Bible? No, I'm not saying that at all. And this is just my opinion. Take it only with the weight of knowing that this is just Dan's opinion. But as I look at this, I start to think, I don't think only 2% of our church is reading the Bible. I believe it's a lot higher than that. So what what starts to ring true in my head is that I realize the people that are coming to me for counsel are the ones that aren't going to God for counsel. And they're saying, I need you to tell me what God wants me to do because I haven't read my Bible and found out what God wants me to do. Now, Am I saying we shouldn't go to counsel for each other? Absolutely not. The Bible tells us we should have a multitude of counsel around us. You should have wise people around you that you ask advice for all the time. But what I'm saying is God has given it to you. He's put it in your hand that, that you can know the plans for your, God has for your life. That you can get into his word and see what God expects of you as his child. That you can learn what types of things you're supposed to do in your life so that you can be blessed. He's put it in your hands. And Hosea says, my people are destroyed because of their lack of knowledge, because they're not opening up the Bible. They're not finding out what God wants from me. See, it's really a question of spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity is based on when your decisions line up with God's word. When you make decisions, do they line up with the word of God? See, it's Spiritual maturity is when the decisions you make do line up with the Word of God. The opposite of spiritual immaturity is when you're making decisions and they don't line up with the Word of God. So to be spiritually mature does not matter how long you've been saved. It does not matter how old you are. It does not matter the life experiences you've been through. Spiritual maturity comes from deciding that you are going to put your decisions into God's plan for your life. So I've met people that who have not been Christians for very long, maybe just a month or two, who are showing great spiritual maturity because they look back at their life and say, when I was doing it my own way, nothing was working. I was, I was hurting people, I was failing, uh, I was struggling, I was depressed, and all these different areas. Everything I did and tried didn't work, so I'm going to do it God's way. And God's way says I should forgive this person, so I'm going to do that. God's way says I should serve, so I'm going to do that. God's way says I should give, so I'm going to do that. So they start lining up their decisions with God's word, and then they start to see huge blessings come as a result of that. And the opposite of it, I've seen people who have been in church their entire lives. And they know the truth, but they still go, well, I think, I know God says we should do it this way, but I'm going to do it that way. God says we shouldn't run our business this way, but I'm going to go ahead and try it this way instead. You see, failure after failure after failure. It comes from knowing the truth and then being faithful to that truth. See, if something is important to you, you will be faithful to it. In closing, there was a man by the name of Jehoash, a king who um, was going to go into war and in taking his army into war, he wanted to know that he was going to win the war. And he was saying, if there's something that God could tell me to do and I could do it so that I would win, I want to know what that is. So Jehoash went before the man of God, the prophet by the name of Elisha, and said, is there anything that I can do? What is God saying that I should do right now, that I could be faithful to right now so that God will bless me? And we see this in 2 Kings 13, 18. It says, 
Then he said, this is Jehoash. Uh, or, sorry, this is Elisha talking to, talking to Jehoash. Then he said, take the arrows. And the king took them. Elisha told him, strike the ground. So Jehoash, I want to be blessed. I don't want to die in this battle. I don't want to lose anyone. How can we know we're going to win this war? Elisha prays, asks God, God, what do you want him to do? God says, have him start striking the ground with his arrows. So Jehoash takes a bundle of arrows. He says, strike the ground. He struck the ground three times and stopped. And the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it. But now you only defeat them three times. See, the first time I read this, I thought, that's kind of strange. How do you know, like, uh, why strike it three times? Why strike it five times? Why six times? What does that even mean? Well, God was telling Jehoash through the prophet Elisha, what I want you to do, Jehoash, is begin hitting the ground with the arrows. And, and so Jehoash takes the arrows and goes, one, two, three. And he stops and looks at Elisha. This isn't working. Like, what is supposed to happen here? And Elisha's mad at him because he goes, wait a minute. God told you to hit the ground. Did God ever tell you to stop hitting the ground? Did God ever tell you to quit? Why, why did you quit? God told you, you needed a breakthrough. God told you what the break, how the breakthrough would come. You started it, and then you stopped. Why did you stop? Because I think so many of us have found ourselves in that exact same place. When we pray and we say, God, I need a breakthrough. I need a breakthrough in my finances. God, what do you want me to do? Is it, God says, well, I want you to trust me. I want you to tithe. And we go, okay, I'm, I'm going to try it. And we, and we go, we write that 10% check, and that's huge, and I'm scared, and I don't know. And, and we put it in the plate one day, and then we go home, and we cross our arms, and we go, okay, bless me. Bless me, God. Run out of time. Come on. There you go. It didn't work. It didn't work. I'm not, I, obviously that didn't work. I got to find out something else. I got to figure out something else because that didn't work. And God's going, who told you to stop? Did, well, did, did I say stop? Because I told you how to get your breakthrough. I, you need help in your relationships. I told you to forgive them. You forgave them once and now you're mad at it again. Who told you to stop? Guys, I, I think for so many of us, we get so close to blessing, and then we stop and miss out on exactly the blessing we've been looking for for so long. In the book of Galatians, uh, the apostle Paul was talking, he said, guys, it's like if you're, you're planting a field and you want there to be a harvest. You want there to be a field, a, a blessing. When, when you're doing spiritual things, when you're following God, when you're obeying Him, you are planting seeds into your future. You're planting seeds into your spiritual life, into your emotional life, into your physical life, your physical health. You're doing that by, by following me. You are planting seeds of a harvest of blessing. But, but then he tells us in Galatians 6, 9, he says, So let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And I think for many of us, we have gotten right to a place where, where we've done all the right stuff. We, we've followed God. We're going to church every week. We're, we're asking Him to bless us. We're trying to get to a place where, where we're moving forward in every area of our life. And it's like, as soon as we start doing better, then the enemy starts attacking us a little bit more, and we're going, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And as the enemy is attacking us, trying to, to discourage us, for some of us who've gone, I guess it's just not working. And what the enemy's trying to do is he's trying to get you to walk away from the very field that you're going to have harvest. Trying to get you to walk away from your church. Trying to get you to walk away from your wife. Trying to get you to walk away from your job. He's trying to get you to walk away from something that you've sowed into faithfully for so long. And now that it's difficult, we want to give up. And if we give up, we're saying, all right, you can have all of my blessing. I just don't want it anymore. See, that's not God's plan for us. God's plan is that we learn this verse that he tells us that, that if we are his disciples, we will remain 
faithful to the truth that he has given us. And I think one of the incredible things we see in our church family here is the fact that we have a children's ministry, and you can go ahead and bring them up, jail. We have a children's ministry who are being taught to be faithful to the things of God at a very early age. And it's incredible. As, as an adult, I run into people all the time that says, I wish I would have learned these things as a kid. I wish I would have learned how to be faithful and how to show love to God and how to trust Him and worship Him and, and read His Word as a kid so it would be easier for me now. And today, guys, we, you are going to get to see a great group of kids as they come in who are not only being taught to be faithful, but they are showing that they are being faithful to the truth that God is giving them. So we want to bring in our second through fifth graders right now and let them share with you a little bit of what they're learning. So since they're a little nervous coming in, this kind of scary stand on the stage, please welcome them with me as they come in today. These are our second through fifth graders. That's correct. Second through fifth graders. Uh, we've been practicing forever, probably like the last two months, on this song and this memory verse. Um, the song is called Solid Rock. We've actually done it here in Big Church, too, so you might know it. Um, and then we've also got a memory verse that is um, known as a blessing um, in, in numbers. And so they're going to share that with you as well as um, explain some of the words that are in there because some of those words are kind of big, if you believe me or not. Um, so we're going to... Uh, sing this song to you guys, and then we're going to go um, straight into this memory verse. So there's a lot of them. All right, I think it's the last. All right, kids, you guys ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. Standing on your promise. And I will
All right, here we go. On Christ they solid. Do it again. Uh-huh. All right, one more time, nice and loud. Here we go. On Christ this Peace, absence of mental anxiety or worry, to be in complete security, harmony, and wholeness with God. Guys, it's incredible. It's incredible what our kids are learning, but they're doing it because of the faithfulness of these workers. So let's give these workers a big round of applause and thank them today. Pray with me, church family. God, we are so thankful for the fact that um, uh, we get to see what you're doing in our church, not just in us, but generationally, God. We're so thankful for the fact that um, uh, our faithfulness doesn't only affect us, but affects the people below us, and God, you're using that uh, as generational blessings, and we thank you for that, God. I pray for each and every person in this room that you would speak to us today as we leave. Because, God, we know what areas we need to be faithful to you and what areas we need to obey you where we haven't in the past. And we pray, Lord, that we would be people who are now faithful to you from now on. Even when it gets tiring, even when it's not fun, we're still going to do what you want us to do. So, Heavenly Father, I pray you bless and protect us today, God. Watch over us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give him a shout of praise before we leave today. We'll have a wonderful weekend and go Broncos.